I'd go so far as to say there's not a lot of point teaching unless you have a mission. Would you agree with that? Definitely. And I think when I decided that I had a mission and I was going to go for it, that's when I became excited about teaching piano. And that's when it was exciting to plan, oh, what am I going to do this week? You know, and uh, until you have that energy and that vision, it is going to be probably kind of boring and little dull and, you know, here he comes again at four o'clock. You know, it's just not going to be nearly as fun. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Well, good day, everyone. Welcome back to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode number 112. And if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching members, then a very special welcome to you, of course. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, It means a lot that uh, you'll be spending time with me in your earbuds, doing whatever it is that you're doing, driving, running, walking the dog. Uh, It's great to be uh, speaking with you today. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help you in your teaching and in your growth of your own studio. Today's show notes and full transcript are available now at timtopham.com slash episode 112. This episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano. And this is a digital hybrid piano that I've been mentioning for a couple of months now, created by Casio in conjunction with the fantastic acoustic piano manufacturer C. Beckstein in Germany. And of course, this combination of Casio's skills in digital technology combined with Beckstein's knowledge and history of acoustic piano manufacturing means that the Selviano Grand Hybrid really does have effectively parents from both sides of the hybrid divide. And as you've heard me mention before, the sound and action of this instrument is truly authentic. But in my opinion, the the, the benefits of the hybrid piano are much more than just a truly authentic touch and being able to put headphones on. It's lower running costs overall because I don't need tuning and you can move them around your house without paying piano movers to come in and help you. You've also got the options for playing along with these amazing integrated accompaniments. You've got the choice of many pianos and sounds and... Unlike other piano manufacturers, these hybrids start at a price that studio owners, in my opinion, can afford, and that's around the $5,000 mark. I also really like the wide grand piano style music rest. How annoying is it when some digital pianos have these terrible flimsy little stands where your music just falls off? Not on this one. It is just like a grand piano and I really like that. Uh, And I also kind of like you can open the lid at the back and actually see the grand piano action. So great for teaching and it is great for playing. I know you'll enjoy it. Visit soundtechnology.com.au for more information and find out where you can go and test out a Selviano Grand Hybrid today. This week, we're continuing on our theme of starting as a new piano teacher. Hopefully, you will have listened to last week's interview with Joe Harkins, who was talking about his experience as a new piano teacher. This week, we're talking about effective lesson planning for new and older teachers, for that matter, both the big and the small picture. And we've put together a fantastic freebie today, which I really hope you go to the show notes page and download. My guest today has actually put together a lesson plan guide and template that you can download and follow in your studio, gives you her four main steps that she uses and also the bigger picture view, which is really important. And you'll remember Joe actually talking about this last week. My guest today needs little introduction. She's actually been on the podcast before, way back, would you believe, in episode number five when we were talking about balancing the eye and the ear. Uh, And then we actually featured her again in our two-part 100th episode special because it was so good the first time. She owns a tech-savvy, creative-based piano studio. She blogs at 88pianokeys.me and authored the iPad Piano Studio. Do you know who it is yet? She's an organist, a nationally recognized clinician, co-founder of 88 Creative Keys with Bradley Sowash, and coordinator of the Piano Preparatory Program at the University of Denver. She also happens to be a good friend. Great to have you on the show, Leela Viss. 
Well, thank you, Tim. I am honored to be here. Very honored. And I didn't know I have that long of history with you, but congratulations. <laughs> it's it, it's less, at least two years ago and then more because uh, we'd been conversing conversing way before you came on the podcast so uh it's and that was why i so enjoyed actually meeting you for the first time face to face and spending time with you it was great uh and look you got a great rap from joe last week he's thoroughly enjoying his studies with you so i thought oh, we've got to get you on the show to talk about this important area of lesson planning because it can it's a real concern for new teachers and even if it's not a concern for older teachers or more experienced teachers, um, I think some of us perhaps could do this area a little bit better. And so I know that some of the ideas you're going to talk about today will help. Now, you, you're obviously incredibly busy with all the things that you do, particularly in your new position at Denver. Um, can you give us a, a taste of what your week looks like now, if you have a normal-ish week? Well, my normalish week is today is Sunday, so I played organ and piano and jammed with the band and had a great time, so used all my skills that you can imagine, playing by ear, reading, all that kind of stuff, and then tomorrow is Monday, and I prep for the week in my studio on Monday mornings, and then I start teaching around noon, off and on, until about 7.30, and then on Tuesday, I teach a few lessons in the mor- uh, in the mid-afternoon, and then I go to DU and meet with graduate students there, and we kind of think through things during the week and uh, talk about their group lesson experience and their private lesson experience. And then we go set up the room and teach a group lesson, and we all teach a private, a couple of private lessons. They do. I teach one private lesson. And then Wednesday, I pretty much do the same thing as Tuesday. Thursday, I pretty much teach all day here in my studio and then choir rehearsal at night. Friday, I plan for the next week, and I teach in the afternoon. And then in between all of those things, I practice, and I like to blog and oh yes, and I exercise a little bit too. So <laughs> you do, you, you exercise. You're very fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> we, we met running. I remember when I was staying with you. There you go. <laughs> um, wow, that that is that is action packed. How is it that you're teaching so much during the day? Is that homeschoolers or adults or, or who's you teaching? Yeah, that's a good question. It is. It's a mix of homeschoolers and adults, both. Um, right. And yeah, it just so happens. And I've got a couple of online lessons. Uh, students as well who are adults that I can see during the day. So yeah, it fills up most of most of my daytime, you know. So which is nice. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, it's great. You've got that flexibility so you're not kind of jam pack everything into 3 to 7 p.m. like so many of us. Correct. Uh, it's great. And, and I feel like I turn into a pumpkin at about 6:30, 7 o'clock. That's how I've always felt. I really don't like teaching later on at night. I know some teachers do and that's great for them, but not ideal for me. Yeah. No, my brain is much better in the morning and early afternoon for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm interested to just dig a little bit deeper into your DU position. Well, what's it all about, your role exactly? Oh, that's a good question. I'm the coordinator of the piano prep program, which is directed by Chi Tan, and she was hired there as a part-time, she's the head of the pedagogy department, which is a part-time position. And she is uh, set up this program so that it's a laboratory for her graduate students to practice teaching. And so it's my job to recruit students to fill the two levels of classes that we have right now. And then I also have to set up and schedule all the private lessons because each student has a group lesson and then one private lesson all within the same week. So it's they get you know, the best of both worlds in one week. And then I teach lessons with the help of the graduate students. I teach the group lessons and then I mentor them. So I make sure that we have regular meetings and make connections and exchange ideas and whine a little bit and then we get over it and then we move on. <laughs> uh, wine, you mean not, not drinking wine? <laughs> no, 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 complain. no, no, no. Right, okay. <laughs> just, just, you know, like how are we going to do this and why isn't this happening? And, it, yeah. you know, and it's, and they ask really good questions, which challenge me as well. It makes me really think. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the gist of that. Job. So the lessons that you organize for them to teach, are they taught while you're all there watching or are they lessons they teach on their own during the week? Well, that's a good question. It's really what I am doing is I'm planning the lessons, planning the group lessons, and the graduate students help me set up the room. They see the plan beforehand, and then I decide who's going to teach what. And for the most part, I'm teaching most of the segments just because 
I know how I want it to go. And their job really is to observe me, which is a little weird because I'm under the microscope all the time. So they're sitting there taking notes while I'm trying to rile up and round up eight little kiddos, but the, and they're helpful as well. And then I'll give them assignments as well. Here, I want you to teach this, this part here and this part here. And uh, I think it's working really well. I think next semester things will change. I will teach less, they'll teach more, and then I'll give them more feedback. It, it just became ev- evident to me that when I gave them a a big chunk of the lesson to teach, it it didn't go exactly as I had intended it to go. And so that means that I probably have to do more modeling for them yet. It's, it's a first year for me too. So I'm just figuring it out. Mm. Well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, we're talking today about what it's like being a new teacher and that can be a fairly terrifying (laughs) experience in some ways. Uh, You were completely new in this role. Did you get a sense of some of those new teacher nerves when you started this role? Yes and no. I think the strangest thing was not being in my own place. So I didn't know where my, I had a, where did I put this and where is that and what's the plan? And, you know, I'm still getting myself organized because it's in a new place. So that was unsettling to me. And also being, you know, I'm what I'm on the stage trying to be this perfect teacher and I'm just not that. (laughs) I have a lot of fun, but I don't do everything perfectly. But I, I, you know, in the end, I think it all works out. Um, It's uh, teaching is an art and, you know, we all get better at it. Mm. Uh, but, you know, not having a, a perfect lesson is reality too and, and students need to see that. We all uh, have epic fails sometimes. <laughs> Things don't work, everything breaks, it's terrible and that's reality. Uh, so. And we had an epic fail and it was because I assumed something far too soon into the year. So, and that was with the level two class who I did not see what happened last year. And so I assumed they were at a point. So, you know, huge lesson learned there. And, and I think that's the other thing is in a position like this, you cannot be any more humble (laughs) because you, you just, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to like take, take pride in anything right now, no, that's just not going to happen. It's going to be, let's try this out. Let's try this. Let's try this. And now we're finding routines. We're finding things that work. It, it's it's coming along nicely. And, you know, despite it all, kids are resilient. They're having a great time. So yeah. that that's the best thing about it. I think having a spotlight on you as a master teacher all the time when you're teaching would have to mean that you have, one, improved your own practice, I would guess. Two, are probably doing much more lesson planning than you were doing before. Would I be right? Oh, yes. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm hmm. And really digging deep into, whoa, how do I do that? You know, it's, it's so ingrained. It's, it's this natural thing. It's organic and I don't even think about it. And now I have to, so it, which is good. It's, um, and because I can always improve what I'm doing myself as well. Mm. Well, lesson planning can be a real concern among teachers of all ages and abilities, but certainly when they're starting out. And I know when I first started teaching through college, uh, like teaching college, classroom teaching, lesson planning was fundamental. You had to give all your lecturers, you had to plan whole units of study before you taught a class, you'd be handing over lesson plans. We did it all the time. And then I didn't do it so much after that, interestingly enough. Why is this important? Why is lesson planning important? Well, it, first of all, it gives you an outline and a direction of what are you going to do? Because if you just go from week to week, that's, you're not thinking long-term and who is sitting on your bench. You have to be thinking about that. And then my, my advice is go check your mission statement. And if you don't have a mission statement, now would be the time to have one because that's going to be your direction. That's your ultimate goal. Where do you want this child 10 years from now? Um, So a, a lesson plan, even though it may sound, whoa, that's pretty lofty. It's good to have that, you know, goal far out way ahead of you because you can always think backwards from then. Um, Also, it's a great way to just mark your milestones and achievements. And for students, they need to see that progress. They need, whoa, okay, you just, you know, did really well at this festival and look what you were playing last year. Now look what you're playing this year. And um, even in a lesson plan, just 
seeing, you know, at the beginning of the book, they hardly knew what a steady beat was and now they can keep it no matter what. And it just, it's a good way to track those things. And actually, I think we should celebrate those milestones just a little bit more. It doesn't have to take a festival or uh, a competition of some sort or a recital in order to celebrate some of those things that, you know, students can struggle with for for years. Uh, and then all concepts build upon each other. Uh, music is a spiraling subject and just like math. So, you know, one concept is built on the shoulders of the, the one before it. So you cannot multiply if you don't know what addition is. And um, that's the same thing with music. And I don't know if you're familiar with Jerome Bruner, but um, he was the one that really studied this idea of a spiraling curriculum. And I like what he says. He says that teachers are an education is not just to impart knowledge, but instead to facilitate a child's thinking and problem solving skills. So we're not just giving them content, but we are giving them content that they put together and make it into a skill and a lifelong passion even. So I think that's really important to think about. We're laying a foundation and then we continue to build upon that. So I, I think that's that's the main, those are the three things. You know, uh, it's an outline, it gives you milestones to measure and you're always building upon something. Mm. Uh, and and well well summarized. And uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of this idea of having a direction and goal. I think it is absolutely critical. I like that you phrase it as a mission statement. I, ha I haven't used those terms before, uh, but why not? It's what businesses do, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, it makes a lot of sense. It should set your goal. What is your mission for your students? What are you trying to achieve? It, it is so fundamental. And really, there's no point doing lesson planning. In fact, there's, I'd go so far as to say there's not a lot of point teaching unless you have a mission. Would you agree with that? Definitely. And I think when I decided that I had a mission and I was going to go for it, that's when I became excited about teaching piano. And that's when it was exciting to plan, oh, what am I going to do this week? You know, and uh, until you have that energy and that vision, it is going to be probably kind of boring and little dull. And, you know, here he comes again at four o'clock. You know, it's just not going to be nearly as fun unless you you plan things out and plot a graph of success for a student. And do you share that with your students? so that they know what their direction is? Oh, that's a good question. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, they, you know, kids live in the moment. They're not really thinking about long-term goals. In fact, I do countdowns before recitals and stuff because I don't, you know, a lot of them don't know what the future looks like. They, they are in the moment. They're not thinking, I'm looking at like, oh, you guys, you need to have this memorized. The recital's a month away. And they're thinking, what? The recital's a month away. I don't need so to do anything. It, it, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> so it's completely different. I don't think that's so important to them as much as, them seeing themselves make progress, you know, and, yep. and having fun and, and moving forward on pieces that they like, you know, that's important to them. Yeah, um, I actually want to follow up that idea of marking achievements. So you were talking about yeah, ways that you can track and celebrate milestones. And I'm interested to know what ideas you have around this because the traditional ones are they sit in an exam or they play in a recital. They're really, we, we haven't, really got many other alternatives. Maybe they upload a video to YouTube. But they're really the ways we assess achievement in music, and particularly the recital. That's the, the main one. But the way you and I teach, there's a lot of knowledge that students are picking up along the way that isn't necessarily best demonstrated in a recital. Their, their ability to play something that they hear uh, on the spot or their ability to compose a chord progression or something like that. Have you thought of ways of celebrating those kinds of milestones with students? You're putting me on the spot. I am. And I mean, the reason I ask it is because I'm thinking about this a lot more at the moment myself, and I'm trying to come up with with options. There's, there's a high school over there called High Tech High over in, in, it's probably California, but I'm not sure, somewhere in America, and they are all about project-based learning. So students do, the whole school is based around, pro, students do a project, and then at the end of that, their assessment is to present their findings and their learning in a conversation, a presentation to, to people, to, to their family and a small group of their class. And I think 
That's so cool. That is that is a great skill because students need to be able to do that and they have to summarize what they've learned. And I've been thinking about this more in the terms of, of piano education and music education. So I don't know. I, I might have put you on the spot. It's a tricky question. Well, I have every student compose. I did that last year. I don't know if I'll have it, them do that again this year, but then they play their compositions at a recital. Uh, just even though it is recital-based, it's still one of those accomplishments that they can enjoy even if they didn't play it at a recital because we print it out they make a beautiful cover to go with it we make a youtube video to go along with it so yeah it is a type of project and they just so happen to play it at a recital i think one of the coolest things and this is not necessarily a studio-based opportunity at all is i'll have kids say oh i just played this at school you know and the the fact that they had a cool song to play at school is probably one of the biggest milestones that they can be proud of, you know, even more than playing at a recital, their friends just saw them play. So if I can give them repertoire that they're proud of and excited to play, and then they want to play it at school for their friends, I think that's really cool. Yeah. It's all those little performance opportunities where they've just got two friends and a piano and they're just demonstrating something. That's a milestone for kids because exactly. that gives them that peer support. Oh, yeah, so, you know, uh, wow, you're amazing and that makes them want to keep learning and, and things like that. Yeah. Anyway, we could we could talk about that. <laughs> oh, we could. And I have something called music money and then they have little punch cards and whenever they perform outside of the studio for any kind of event, some of them play on in bands or worship teams or whatever, then they get a punch on their punch card and once they get five punches, they can get a gift card to something. So I do celebrate it, but it's probably not in that same way. But I think also music is a little different, but it's not about winning the prize. It's it's about, hey, I did this and this is my skill and I'm really excited about it. And um, that's, you know, if we can celebrate that with the student, I think that's where it's at. Mm. All right. Well, let's get back to the lesson planning question at hand. How do you coach? Let's get straight into it. How do you coach your pedagogy students to go about effective lesson planning? Let's break it down. All right. Well, Let's see. I've got a couple of different answers for that because uh, you were talking about, you know, uh, units and and you know, should we follow a method book, all that kind of stuff. So I, I want to hit that topic just a little bit, and then I'll jump into the lesson planning. Sure. So first of all, I think some of the things that we need to think about is those mistakes that we make as teachers, and I say we because I am pointing the finger at me just as much as anybody else. Okay. So let me just uh, state those things. First of all, we forget that we teach human beings rather than a method. Mm. And I think that's ultimately what we need to remember every time that student walks in the door, they have a history, they have a background, they have a day that we don't know about. And, uh, we, you know, we can set an agenda, but that agenda needs to be set aside for that human being that's sitting in the bench. We have to get to know them and re and build a relationship with them. And then oftentimes we could forget what it's like to be in the hot seat. I, I just think about this with some of my adult students, you know, they get really nervous when they have to play for me and I'm like, it's okay, you know? And, and yet I think it's important for us to remember what that feels like. So I encourage teachers to go take a class of some sort where you have to be on the spot or you have to follow instructions. Notice how the instructor made you feel. Did they make you feel comfortable? Did they encourage you? Did they seem to, I don't know, you know, make you feel uncomfortable? Those are all really good things to take back to your own studio. So don't forget what it's like. The other thing about that is when they come in and, you know, you know how we can have that discussion. Well, did you practice? You know, mm. I don't, I never start a lesson that way, no, but not. I will. Okay. I, but I will model a piece. I'll say, Oh, let's, let's play this piece. I, let me play it for you a minute. And even if they didn't practice or they practiced a little bit, at least now they've got it in their ear. Oh yeah, that's right. You, you're giving them, you know, just a little foretaste of what's to come and it can just put them at ease. Like, okay, good. That's how it is. Cause remember they're probably just coming from school wherever. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important to remember that hot seat. Um, and then if something's not sinking in, I think teachers often forget that it's not the student's fault. It is our fault. If, if something is not connecting with them, 
you know, we better go stand at our hands or something to make sure that this child understands it. It means we need to step back, whatever it takes. It's, it's on our end. It's not the child's fault. Mm, I think about that a lot in my teaching. When something doesn't click, uh, it, most often for me, it's because I've gone too fast. I've assumed knowledge that they don't have or I, I haven't taken the steps to lead up there or I've just, re- I've just phrased it badly. Or I've, talked, or I've talked too much, which, I, right. which happens too. Oh, well, that's what I was going to say next is uh, pacing. Uh, we can all always do better on our pacing. And uh, we end up talking a lot and we make them follow our directions. So I would say if you can play more and talk less and ask questions you know, to guide their learning as much as possible and then let them be the teacher, especially when you've got kids that have the wiggles, you know, I'll sit down like, okay, I'm going to play this, you know, and can you just point? So I'll have a pointer and they will track the notes as I'm playing, which gives me great information. Then I know, oh, are they even reading the notes? Are they following what's going on? All that kind of stuff. And they love to be the teacher, you know, that's, and, and they're standing up, they're doing something different. So just when you're getting predictable, try and change up the pacing just a little bit. Uh, and then we also forget, you know, we like to jump in and say, oh, that was a wrong note or, oh, can you fix that? And I would say step back and let the student self-evaluate before you jump in, because what are they going to be doing at home? They have to do their own self-evaluation. They have to know how they did. So you have to build that into your lesson time. Oh, OK. How would you do? Well, I don't know. Well, did you feel good about line one? Oh, yeah, I think I missed whatever. You know, try and guide them into you know how successful they were. Mm, it's um, it's a really hard skill for students to to pick up, but it, and it certainly won't happen if we're always telling them what's wrong. Uh, but it's a slow process, I find, for a lot of students to get them just listening actively to themselves. Correct. Yes, and then I would say the most important thing, probably one of the most important things thing about what teachers can be forgetting is that we overlook uh, overlook one essential element uh, and that is how to practice we kind of assume like okay here you go this is your assignment go home and that is absolutely the the backwards way of doing everything because they don't know what to do when they get home they they've never practiced a piano before so what does that mean and so That has to be part of every lesson is practicing with the students. Now, I know that some parents end up calling a piano lesson a piano practice, and I'm not exactly saying that's what we should be doing, but we need to be practicing with them, give them the practice skills so that they feel confident when they go home that they know what they're doing. And I think that takes a little bit of time. And so, you know, the first couple of lessons, I don't expect them, and I'll tell parents this too, you know, if they practice, some that's great if they remember some of the stuff that's great it, it, it's a while in in the making uh for to groom a wonderful practicer and mm. you know and then they have bad weeks too so <laughs> um it's it's not something that we can take lightly it's very important and i think what what we can do for helping them practice in a lesson is to help them identify the problem find a strategy to solve their own problems and then that's when learning really happens because then they'll take ownership of their lessons mm. and And then piano lessons become a team effort. And then the teacher doesn't just become the one with all the authority, but we're coaching and we're guiding them and inspiring them. And I think there's a difference between that. So there you go. Those are those are some things that I think are, are important to think about as we move into lesson planning. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that last one of, of getting the student to come up with the strategy. So not only do they need to listen themselves, they need to therefore work out what's wrong, but then they need to practice strategy that isn't just playing it from the beginning. And I like I don't know about other people listening, but even me with all my uh, repetition of practice ideas and I've got lots of them and I introduce them to students and we write them down, they still really struggle to make the connection between this is my technical issue and here are the practice solutions that Tim has given me before. I I find that getting them to make those connections really a real struggle. I have to work at it all the time because they'll naturally just go, I'll just, I'll just play it again. Right. Right. Well, and we could do a whole thing on practice strategies, but I would say, you know, if there's two things that people can think about is 
offer practice strategies and I've got some at my blog. And then also I have something called a practice pouch that I give students and that is full of little concrete items so that if they play something perfectly like a passage, then they get a paper clip. And then if they play another passage correctly, then they get another paper clip and then they play those two passages together and they link them together. It's called link and chain practice. And so putting a label on a practice strategy can help a student right away. Oh, I'm going to use this. And I do. I have st- certain students that like, I like link and chain practice. That's what I'm going to use this week. And yeah, you're so, so good with those naming things. Yes. I, I love how creative you are with those. I'm not so good, but I, I'll, I'll work on it. Okay, you work on it. Well, a good friend of mine, she said, you need a handle to grasp something. Right, yeah, it's a good analogy. Isn't that a good, uh, yes, Mm. and it's so true. And Mm. so if you give them names of strategies that work, like I've got backwards practice, just different things like that, they know automatically. I'm I'm saying those who have been in my studio long enough know, yeah, I'm going to use that this week. That's what's going to work. And a lot of times I'll just have a practice strategy of the week. Everybody is going to use this practice strategy. Some of them are like, okay, yeah, I know that one. And then some are like, whoa, that's cool. Never done that one before. So, all right. So now on to the lesson plans. Mm. Now that we've laid the groundwork, Uh, I think there are three secrets of lesson planning. And unfortunately, I wish I would have thought of these three secrets, but I just happened to read them recently on a blog uh, at the Cult of Pedagogy, which I am a big fan of any educational type of site because we can learn a lot from education or educators in general, not just even music educators, but educators in general. And there's an interview there from Norman Ng, his last name is E-N-G, and he actually coaches a lot of college and university teachers. But this is his secret to lesson planning. He says it's uh, it has three steps. What is the concept to teach? How will you teach it? And why is the concept important? I thought, oh, yeah, there we go. I mean, we could be done with the podcast right now because those (laughs) those three things, that's it. You know, that's that's where we go. And then we move forward. Okay. What is the concept to teach? How will you teach it? And why is this concept important? Right. So now I took his saying just a little bit further because, of course, we want to apply it now to those on the piano bench and the piano teachers. Uh, So secret number one, I would say start with the why first, and that's what Norman uh, recommended as well, is the why is the most important part of the one sentence lesson plan. That's what he calls it. It drives behavior according to marketing and leadership consultant, Simon Sinek. I don't know if you've listened to this TED talk before, but it's worth listening to it again. And uh, he argues that top organizations understand that people won't buy into whatever is being sold unless they understand why they're doing it. The why is the emotional pull. So why are they going to want to learn something that you're teaching them unless they know, oh, man, this is going to help me sound just like Billy Joel. Or mm. I, th- if I use rounded fingers, I can play super fast and sound really good. But just telling them, please round your fingers and use this fingering on the scale. That, that's not going to, that's the what, but that's not giving them the why. Right. So, and really that is all about thinking backwards and thinking the bigger picture. Why are you giving this information to the student? And also making connections between things that they either want to do or that they already do with the learning that's going on now, which is crucial. There you go. There you go. Yes. I'm going to talk about connections in just a minute too. So secret number two is identify and isolate the what of the concept uh, or what is the concept. So the secret number one is the why. The secret number two is the what. And I think this is really important. And I think teachers tend to forget to break things down. I noticed you said something about, oh, I made an assumption. We are all really guilty of making assumptions. And so we have to make sure that we break it down into the smallest parts and review each part of it. Um, and then build upon that knowledge. That's that's what I mean by this spiraling curriculum. So, for example, if you're introducing a dotted half note, first of all, you got to make sure they know what a steady beat is. You're going to want to gonna make sure that they know what a quarter note is and a dotted half note, and then they can move forward into the the dotted half note. So um, that's that's really important for us to recognize, and it's not always easy to do, and we need to be patient with ourselves and with our students, because if they're not understanding what a quarter note is, we shouldn't be jumping over to a dotted half note. 
Yeah, correct. Yeah, and so that's there's also a bit of assessment there about where they're actually up to before you take them on this next journey. Right. Yes. And I like what Jerome Bruner says. He's the the, the gentleman that created this idea of spiraling curriculum. Um, be Oh, you have to make the knowledge ready for the child rather than waiting for the child to be ready for the knowledge. Huh. That's cool. I know. Yeah. yeah. So kind of twist your brain around just a little bit, but it, it's something to always be thinking about. You're laying the groundwork. You know, how are you going to make that knowledge so that it connects with that child and, and meets them where they're at? Who was, uh, who was the guy that came up with that idea? Jerome Bruner. Right, I have to do some more research, and I haven't heard yeah. of this concept of spiraling. I've heard of oh, sequ- obviously okay. sequenced curriculum, uh-huh. uh, but yep. this idea of a spiral is slightly—it's a slightly different uh, metaphor, isn't it? It is, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And science and math and music are all very spiraling right. uh, curriculums, for lack of a better word. So then secret number three is choose how to introduce and reinforce these concepts. And this is where uh, you mentioned that I have a template. And this is the template that I use for the whole how part of this. Because isn't that basically what lesson planning is, is how are you going to communicate a new concept? Mm. And so I feel like there's four parts. And this was all from the research that I did for my thesis when I was getting my graduate degree, where uh, Joe is now getting his. And uh, this is all from Lynn Freeman Olson, who was a composer back in the 80s. He passed away quite young, but he wrote Music Pathways with Marvin Blickenstaff and Barbara Crater. So some big names in the pedagogical field. And so this is, I don't think anything new for most people anymore. It's its kind of general and it's been there for a while, but it's still one of the ones that you want to hang on to is first, let the students hear the concept, let them experience playing it, you know, but being able to just hear the difference between a quarter note and a half note let them hear it and make sure that they know what that means and sounds like. Then let them play it. And I'm saying play on a drum, sing it. It doesn't have to be on the piano right away. Just get used to hearing it first and playing it that way. And then show them the symbol. It's really easy to just start, you know, pulling out all those signs and symbols. Okay, what's this? What's this? What's this? Let them experience it first and then show the symbol and then create with it. So those are the four methods or the templates, the stages, if you want to call them, of introducing a concept. And so now you just plug in the concept, you follow those four stages, and you've got a lesson plan. Nice. So just to go over it, we start with why. We identify and isolate the what. So we're breaking things down. We're working out what are the stages of knowledge that need to be built up here. We then choose how they should be introduced and reinforced and therefore how that's going to suit the particular child that you're working with. And then the four, is, is the hear, play and the create, is that part of the fourth stage or is that the third stage? That's, that's all part of the how you're going to approach. Right. Okay. So first of all, you identified what you're going to teach and now how are you going to teach it? Right. Okay. Yep. And, and the why came at the beginning. You know, why do they need to know what a half note is? Well, they're going to find it in their music. And if they play it in a duet, they're going to have to be able to hold it for two beats. Otherwise, they're going to beat their partner to the end of the piece. Yep. That kind of thing. Okay. So, so the la- what was the last step then? Number f- There was four parts, right? Be creative. Yes. Oh, that's the creative yeah. part. Yes. Okay, cool. Correct. So yeah. the, in the how, we're letting them hear first. And I really like mm-hmm. this idea of it's the music learning theory idea of listening first. Listening, yeah. then singing or tapping a drum, or playing, but maybe not even the notes, maybe one note on a piano or on the lid of the piano, whatever it is. Right. And and that's that's a great process for teaching a new concept. And then get creative with it. Right. And so, so showing the symbol of it as well. That, oh, yes, that would yes, sorry, after yes. the play. And here's the deal. I feel like the play and the create kind of go together. You know, you could have them being creative before they even know the symbol. The symbol is really the last thing that needs to be uh, introduced because you want them to understand it in their bodies first and in their minds. And then they see the symbol. And of course, then the symbol is important because they have to know what to do when they see it. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. That that process. Um, interestingly enough, where the the concept that you got this from had why at the end, didn't it? When you read it out did. the quote, yeah. Yes. But it makes much yes. more sense having it at the beginning. It does because yeah. that is the most important part, really. And uh, then it comes we're getting back to the mission statement as well, too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And then within these steps, because this is what's so hard for me, because then I just keep thinking, oh, but maybe we should add this. And so, and I'm just looking back at my own teaching on what I do. I supercharge things with connectivity, is what I call it. So, for instance, you know, to help students with a rhythm pattern. Um, I asked them, what'd you have for lunch? Oh, you had cheese pizza. So cheese, pizza, cheese, pizza, cheese, pizza. Oh, that could be a half note and then two quarter notes, something like that. So everything that they learn, I try and connect it with something that they already know. And that could be within the music world or without, um, with, you know, outside of the music world. Yeah. In fact, that's probably almost better. Correct. Exactly. That's what I really want teachers to understand is that these four stages are are there, but you want to, within each stage, make sure you connect it somehow to something that the student already knows. Make the, the um, relate the unknown to the known is probably the best way to put it. And then because I like tech uh, and apps and all that kind of stuff, I, I offer some tech plugins. These are all ways to help you through those four stages. There's plenty of apps that test hearing, um, that let them be creative, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, that's that's my way of adding technology into a lesson. Is I'm thinking, okay, well, this app will really help them by drilling what half notes versus quarter notes look like. You know right. what I mean? Yep. And then I don't have to do that in the lesson so much. Uh, I'll let the technology help me with that. And then one other important thing is uh, I call it a gamification plugin because <laughs> you got no, you got technology and technology. There's going to be a lot of games, but uh, there's a lot of games that you can play in, in within a lesson. And I just heard a great TED talk on play and the importance of play. And um, I think that of course it encourages and enhances learning, but you want your students to have fun at your lesson, right? Because right. if they have fun, they're going to want to come back the next day. So adding a game and that games can be easy. You know, I'll say, okay, how fast can you find where your hands are going to go for this piece? <gasps> mm. Ooh, let's see if you can do it a little bit faster than that. You know, just little things like that, gamifying things to make it exciting will again, keep that pace going. So you could add those two plugins to those steps right there. So the two plugins being supercharging with the connectivity. I like that, that turn of phrase and then using gamification or technology or both. Correct. Yeah. 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 Mm. I know. So that's why I said, I'm still working on this all because it, it keeps coming at me in all these different aspects. It really is a multifaceted career that we're in, right? You know, we've got a lot of things that we are teaching. We're not just teaching what's two plus two, but we're teaching what's two plus two. And now how do you put that on the piano and how do you play it musically? And, you know, so we need to have a lot of things in our back pocket ready to go. And so that's why, although I have a four step template, there's a lot of things that you could add within it. Mm. One of my biggest mistakes is trying to do too much in lessons, mm-hmm. particularly getting ex- overexcited myself about all the fun things that could come out of this. <laughs> Do you find that lesson planning helps mitigate that for you? It does. And then I tend to run over and I don't get to everything that I want to. Yeah. It's, and I think that's okay. Mm, I that's feel a better like, way to be yeah. than not enough. Correct. And I feel like if, if, if you're in the moment and things are going well, that is not the time to shut down. That is the time, you know, you've just made a connection with the child. So, you know, don't stop and say, Oh, now we got to go on to our next thing. Unless you know that it's, you know, getting a little ridiculous, but, um, yeah, timing is, and and that's what I was going to say is that's a whole nother thing is how to, time everything and fit everything in. And I honestly don't fit everything in. And if there's an assignment, you know, something written on an assignment sheet that I don't get to, I put in capital letters first, which means that's what we're going to go to first. So that means that they'll keep practicing it. We hope, 
during the week. And then we'll get to that first next time. So I, I'm not perfect. I don't get to everything. And that just happens, of course, when we're getting close to a deadline too. Mm. things may, you know, just kind of be on hold while we focus in on something too. And I think that's okay. That's yep. fine. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Teachers should never feel, in my opinion, that they should cut something off if it's going really well with the student, you've made a great connection, they're really enjoying it, they're learning a lot from whatever it is that you're doing, I I would discourage teachers from feeling like you've got to cut it off to because you've got to fit everything else in that lesson. It's okay every now and then to just go with the flow of a lesson. And if you miss the scales that week, you know what? The world's not going to cave in. It's okay. <laughs> I think you Correct. probably have a similar approach. Oh, definitely. And, you know, somebody reminded me too, and this is a good reminder for all of us. There are very few people that get a chance. I teach one-on-one -on -one lessons. I have two at a time, actually. One's doing off-bench activities while I'm doing on-bench. And I have access and the privilege of working with this child one-on-one -on -one that most people do not ever get with a child. And so, you know, we got to enjoy that moment. And the last thing I want to do is you know, destroy it by, oh man, we got to do this and oh, we got to do this and, and be so regimented that we can't enjoy the moment. Mm, 100%. We are very lucky in that way, which classroom teachers, for example, will never have that uh, right? flexibility. Is there a different approach when it comes to teaching one-on-one -on -one versus groups and the amount of lesson mm -hmm. planning that's required? Oh, yes. <laughs> I do a lot more lesson planning for the group. And that and I also in my studio, I offer group lessons about once every two months. And I do major planning for that because I know I don't want to run out of ideas. I also am really excited because this is my opportunity to introduce or drill things that I feel like everybody needs help on. And, and this is the time to do it, you know? So I'm, man, I jam those lessons full of just so many things uh, that are so much more fun to do within a group. Mm. So yes, I do a lot more planning um, as a, for group lessons than I do private. Now, like I say, on Mondays, I prep for what I'm going to do during the week. So that's when I prep my off bench time. And I kind of think about what am I going to do this week? And I've got different things going for different levels of students, but overall there may be an overarching theme. Like right now we're working a lot on intervals and um, hearing them, identifying them, all that kind of stuff. So regardless of the level, some advanced students will be working on, you know, what's the difference between major and minor sevenths where, where um, other students will be talking about what's a second versus a third, that kind of thing. But it helps me to stay organized if I do that kind of planning. And then I can reinforce any of that that we talk about at the lesson. Right. And that's something that is also with the spiral curriculum. You know, I don't necessarily worry so much about, okay, what's going on at the piano? Does it have to be reinforced right away off the bench? we're always going to be coming back around to a topic again. We'll hit it again. If they didn't quite get all those intervals, we'll be doing it again. So it's, it's one of those things that even though I know I like to mark milestones, I also know that that constant reinforcement will, will get them where they need to be. Mm. What mistakes do you think teachers make when it comes to lesson planning? Well, I kind of covered that already with my laying the groundwork of all those mistakes right there. Uh, you know, like we forget to let students self-evaluate. We forget that we have to teach them how to practice. Mm. If I was going to add anything more to that, um, I think we need to be ready to be on our toes. I think we can't be so regimented that we can't do something differently. And... I think if we have an agenda, that's great, but we also have to be willing to step away from that agenda for that the, the needs of the student. Right. And um, just go, I'll start wrapping up really, really soon. But what, in, how much input do you feel students should be given into mm -hmm. the content and structure of their lessons? That's a good question. I don't know if people would agree with me or not, but. I like my students to run the lesson as much as possible. I'll say, okay, what do you want to start with? Because that will get them up and running. They'll get their book out. They'll find it. And then they'll start playing. It's usually because I'm getting somebody else ready to go off the bench. But it shows me, number one, what did they like practicing the most? What's their favorite piece? 
that shows me if they're excited about being there in general. And most of the time, you know, I get a positive response from them and they get their book and they start playing. And that also shows me, do they know how to get out the book from the book bag (laughs) and can they find it on the right page? All that kind of stuff. That's called executive functioning. That's a whole nother thing that students need to learn, you know, students in general in a classroom or at piano. So there's a lot of things that, that they're letting them begin with whatever they want to shows me as a teacher. Uh, And then it, it basically makes it feel like this is a team effort. I'm not the, I don't know, I just heard this quote that I thought was so good. Um, there's leaders and those who lead. And I would feel like I'm one who can lead and guide and inspire, but I don't have to be this leader that, you know, takes charge and has to do everything my way or, or no way. So I think that's an important thing to remember. And then I, what what happens is, I feel like they have taken ownership of their lessons and this is not the parent's lesson. This is not even Miss Leela's lesson. This is their lesson and they're going to, the more they can drive it, the better off. And what's fun is then I'll, you know, I'll say, well, what should we do next? And they'll say, Oh, I think we were supposed to do this first. So then that just gave me information. Oh, they read my lesson notes. Mm. Um, you know, so that is my answer to that question. I don't know. What do you do, Tim? Yeah, I I mix it up. So I like giving students. I'll I'll say exactly the same thing. Hey, what do you want to start with today? And see if they whatever they choose. It's very interesting. Sometimes they'll say, I want to do my scales first and get them out of the way, or I really want to show you this, this pop song that I've played, or whatever it is. So I like doing that. But oftentimes I'll also start with something that I know perhaps I forgot to do last week. So we're going to put it up first up this week. So yeah, we we'll actually need to do some work with your scales today first up, or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, very similar approach. Uh, and I like students having a say in what one what they're learning. But to the structure of a lesson, I think it is important. Um, I, w- I would say that for younger students, really young, so seven, eight, seven, six, seven, eight year olds, I think there, there's a, a sliding scale of teacher sort of control. And, uh, you know, when they're very young, then you're taking most of the decisions, making most of the decisions, you're structuring the lesson. And as they move into teenagehood, then that kind of flips, in my opinion. And, Let me just say that when I say they're in control, they kind of think they're in control. I kind of (laughs) make it that way, you know, but I know I'm driving the lesson. I know where we're headed. I know what we're doing, but I think it just makes them feel at ease. There was one thing that I should add when you said what, what mistakes do teachers make? And I forgot to mention this one. I think this one is really important when a student comes and they haven't practiced and then you assign them the same thing and then they come back and they haven't practiced. I think that's a huge mistake that they're sending you a message that they're not interested in what you're giving them. (laughs) And, and you can bend over backwards trying to get them to practice, but if they don't like it, I would say, let them, you know, make sure they understand the concept, what was talked about there and then move on to something new, try something new. But, you know, really, honestly, do you want to torture them from week to week, (laughs) making them do the same thing? I like You're asking them, uh, yeah. you know, I'm quite honest when that happens. It happened to me many times and I'll just say, okay, I get it. You clearly don't like this piece or something. And, yeah. and they'll often say, no, 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 I like the music. And then you can have a conversation. Well, so I, what, what is it? Why aren't you engaging with this activity? Uh, and I think that's a really useful activity, uh, conversation to have. I have an adult piano student who's a psychotherapist and she calls that approach avoidance. Right, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a reason behind that. And yeah. that's, you're right. If you find out the reason, oh, okay, it's too hard. And that's the thing. It probably is too hard. Maybe you didn't break it down enough. That's information for you again, as a teacher. Yeah. Um, so that, sorry, I forgot that little mistake there. And mm. again, let me just remind everybody that when I'm saying all these things, I'm saying them to myself just as much as anybody else. Oh yeah, so. my hands up as well. Don't worry about yeah. that. We all, we all, none of us are perfect, and we're all learning, and we will always make mistakes because we are learning, uh, and I think that's really important. Leela, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you today. Is there anything that we've missed that you really wanted to uh, to mention on this topic? You know, I think there's one thing I want to say, and I think their feedback matters the most. 
So if you are hearing, oh, I want to do that again, or whoa, that time went fast, I think you know you're on the right track. And congratulations. And you know, then you know your lesson planning is is getting them where they want to go. And they're going to be eager to come back next week. Mm. Well, if you want to find out more about Leela's approach, then you can obviously head to her website, uh, which is 88pianokeys.me. Uh, but you can also, of course, head to timtopham.com slash episode 112, which is where you'll be able to grab her download where she's actually laid this out. So you can actually see her four-step process. She was talking about the what, the sorry, the why, the what, the how, and getting creative and sort of thinking, listening before you start playing things. It's it's such a great approach, Leela. Thank you so much for sharing that with all our readers and listeners. Um, and thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Tim. And thanks for having great podcasts. I'm addicted. I listen to them every week. <laughs> well, thank you. You, you, you. Are you going to listen to yourself on this one? or are you going to Oh, pass? I better do that, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I don't really like listening to myself. So there you go. That might be painful. Uh, we'll see you again soon. I'll probably see you at um, MTNA next year, will I? Yes, yep. I will be there. Hopefully, mm-hmm. uh, many of our listeners will also be able to come up and say hi to you. So, that's um, in Orlando, Florida in March, I think, from memory. Yes, indeed. Uh, mm-hmm. MTNA. Look forward to seeing you there. Uh, thanks again for today. Thanks, Tim. Take care. Now, remember that you can also get updates on Facebook Messenger for these podcasts and my blog posts. It's a one-click process and it means that anytime I re- release something new, you'll get a little reminder in your inbox on Messenger. If you're a Facebook user, then head to timtopham.com slash Facebook and that gives you the one-click button to get connected like that. And again, thank you very much if you've left a review recently on iTunes or Facebook. I really do appreciate those uh, and uh, it's a really quick, easy step. Head to my Facebook page. You can find that by going searching for Tim Topham or Creative Piano Teaching and you'll be able to find out the details there. Next week on the podcast, I'll be talking to the fantastic Nicola Canton from ColourfulKeys.ie. A number of you have been meeting her and getting to know her recently. She has a fantastic blog and community online and she's sharing ideas around a blueprint that she's put together for beginner piano teachers. It's called the Beginning Teacher Blueprint. This is phenomenal, literally from zero to hero teacher in one document. Uh, It's it's fabulous. We're going to be sharing all of that next week. Look forward to listening. uh, Sorry, (laughs) looking forward to speaking to you then. Bye for now, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.